We are in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, and what we finished up last time was we had talked about Paul. He had come before the the uh, he had come uh, before the courts, the court of Ga- Gallio, and um, and then Gallio said he he wasn't interested in hearing this case that was brought against Paul, and because of that, Paul had then enormous freedom to to uh, to share there in Corinth. And so prior to this, it had said earlier in chapter 18 that he had spent a year and a half uh, uh, after the Lord had spoken to him and prior to this, this, this court. And then he spent quite some time after that. So it's believed that Paul may have spent as much as three years in Corinth. So although Paul had a ministry where he would go to different places and, and, and uh, witness and establish churches, some places he was there for, for a short amount of time, a period of, of a month or two. Other places he was there for, for years at a time. Corinth being one of those places because God had spoken to him just a bit earlier as we had read that there were many people, there were many of the elect in that city. Verse 18 of Acts chapter 18. Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Centre he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. Then he came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay on for a longer time, he did not consent. But taking leave of them, and saying, he was taking leave of them, saying, I will return to you again, if God wills, and he set sail from Ephesus. And when he had landed at at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, and then he went down to Antioch. Okay, so Paul then eventually finishes up his ministry in, in Corinth, and he then sets out to go back to his home church, which was in Syria. Syrian Antioch was his home church. Paul felt a great affinity to his home church. He had been sent out. He had been now on ministry for probably four years or so. And now he was returning to his home church. He felt a real oneness with his home church. So he leaves. He says in verse 18, he had set out for Syria. That's where his home church was. And he took Priscilla and Aquila with him. So remember Priscilla and Aquila. That's this couple. And again, interestingly, now Priscilla's name is mentioned before her husband's name. So this couple, the woman, was probably more prominent in ministry. But they were a ministering couple. And in Centre it says he had his hair cut for he was keeping a vow. Now why would the scriptures say such a thing? Well, we don't know for sure, but there were many vows that were taken. One of them was a Nazarite vow, where the the Jews, it talks about this in Numbers chapter 6, would make a vow, and the man was not to cut his hair until the vow was complete. So just as he's leaving town there, as he's leaving Corinth, he cuts his hair. We don't know what the initial commitment was, what the vow was that he made. Maybe it had something to do with the Lord speaking to his heart saying, you know, go ahead, don't be silent, don't be afraid, witness in this town. That was a a profound thing that had happened in his life. Now we know for sure it was not precisely a Nazarite vow, because if it had been a Nazarite vow, there was something very specific about a Nazarite vow, is that the the, the, one, the vow taker was supposed to cut his hair at the temple. Go to the temple in Jerusalem, have his hair cut, and offer up the hair. But there was something here where he was taking a vow. So this was a very traditional Jewish thing. Paul lived by Jewish custom, by Jewish tradition. He did. And Paul was keeping this. But the amazing thing about Paul is he never put this upon others, and especially not upon the Gentiles. That's when it becomes legalism. So you see, Paul could become full of himself and say, hey, I I take vows, I don't cut my hair, I think this is something that everybody should do. And this is the way we are. Whatever we value, we often want other people to do it. If we don't eat meat, we want other people not to eat meat. If we fast twice a week, we want other people to fast twice a week. But all of that is legalism if it's put upon another. 
One can put it upon themselves, that's just fine. Paul put it upon himself to take a vow and not cut his hair. And then when the vow was finished, he would cut his hair. That was a practice that he did, which was a common Jewish practice. That's what he did. But as soon as we put it upon another, it becomes legalism. And Paul didn't do that. And, but he lived very much as a Jew. This is what he did. And so then he came to Ephesus. When they came to Ephesus, he left Priscilla and Aquila there. So he only stayed there for a short amount of time. But he left there Priscilla and Aquila, which we're about to see further up. And in verse 19, it says, He entered the synagogue and he reasons with the Jews. Again, Romans 1.16, Paul felt that the ministry was first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. He gets into a new city, he goes right to the synagogue, first thing. And he starts reasoning with the Jews in the synagogue. And when they asked him to stay, he said, no, I just can't stay. He has just been waiting for the next ship, because we know that in, in verse 18, he had set out to sea for Syria. Well, he went across the Aegean from Corinth to Ephesus, and then he, he set out from, and then when the ship came, he set out from Ephesus directly to Caesarea, so a direct path at that point. So he only stayed there waiting for his ship, and he sailed to, to Ephesus, and, uh, uh, and then he went to Caesarea, and he went up and he greeted the church, and then he went down to Antioch. So he went up because to church at Jerusalem, landed at Caesarea, went to Jerusalem, paid, paid his uh, uh, greetings to the church in Jerusalem, acknowledging the church in Jerusalem with its authority, and then proceeding up to Syria. But it's, 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 uh, uh, it's further north, but it says he went down to Antioch. He went down because Syria is up on a mountain. So I'm sorry, Jerusalem's up on a mountain. So everything from Jerusalem, it was said you go down to. And so he goes down to Antioch. Now, let's think about this. Think about the, the accountability that he felt to his church. Paul, of all people, felt an accountability to his local church. The first thing he wanted to do is the first thing he would do after every missionary journey, he would go back to his church and he would report to them. He would report to them what happened. And he also valued the church at Jerusalem and acknowledged their authority. Paul really understood the principle of the local church, the principle of the church itself, and the broader context of the church as well. The authority out of the church of Jerusalem. Paul acknowledged that. I think in this day, so few of us understand what the body of Christ is and the church. There's very, very little accountability. Now, let me give you an example of what will happen. So, what I always try to do is take the scriptures and just bring it back to us. How does it apply to us? And, and give you an example. A lot of young people go on mission trips for the summer or over Christmas. That's fine. That is a good thing to do. And then when it comes time to go on the mission trip, they'll say, can the church help to support me on this mission trip? I say, yeah, sure. You're a member of the church, right? Well, no, I've never felt... No, I'm not a member. Well, why aren't you a member? You've been coming to the church for two years. Well, I've never really felt, you know, a oneness with the church. Okay, well, if you haven't felt a oneness with the church, why do you want their money? Why do you want their money for for the mission trip? You see how disingenuous that is? And and, uh, um, if you or I cannot find a church in a city like Houston, we have a problem. We really have a problem. I used to have a pastor who used to say, if you have a problem with everybody, it's not everybody else's problem. So, if we can't find a church that we can be a member of, we have a problem. We really have a problem. And you say, well, what constitutes membership? Does attendance constitute a membership? If that church feels that attendance, that attendance constitutes membership, then you're a member of that church. Whatever that local body of Christ says constitutes membership is what constitutes membership for that local body of Christ. And we have been part of churches where, where membership, coming regularly, constituted membership. We have been at other churches that you had to go through a new members class that was six months in order to become a new member of the church. That's what constituted membership. And that's fine. That's what the elders of that church had deemed makes a person a member. Other churches have other things. In this particular church, 
What they ask is that you be baptized in water if you never have been baptized before. And that's out of an act of submission to Christ. And then the next thing is, they ask you to fill out a little card. It's about four lines. And that's it. And in fact, with college students, it's an even lower barrier where you can be with something that's called watch care. So you can still be a member of your church back home, wherever that may be, in Dallas or in Portland or in New York or in Atlanta. You can still be a member of your church, but it's a watch care. Like, now we know who you are. We will pray for you. Now we know that you exist and and, and things like this. If you just come, how do they know you even exist? And so that is what they ask. You just fill out this little card and you stand up there one Sunday morning and then everybody greets you. That's it. It's a very low barrier, but it is a little barrier. And then you say, well, why didn't you become a member of the church? Well, I never felt a real oneness. Remember, the problem is ours. If you can't feel a real oneness with the body of Christ, you ought to go somewhere else where you feel a oneness enough to join. Where you feel a oneness. Paul felt an accountability to the local church. And I've talked with young people about this, and I, and I, and I talk about this. Oh, no, no. They say, I understand the local church. And I'm thinking, you know, you just condemned yourself by saying you understand the local church, but for four years you couldn't join a local church because you couldn't feel a oneness. You don't understand the local church. You don't understand the body of Christ. There is an accountability one to another. Why would Paul, of all people, feel that he has to go back, pay his respects, pay his honor to the church in Jerusalem and his honor to the church in Syria? if he didn't feel a oneness with that local church. That's where he felt his oneness. And it is a good thing to have this. If you're going to go to the mission field, it is a tremendous thing to have the covering of the local body of Christ. You want to have that. That is a good thing. It is disingenuous to expect something from a church that you have never given yourself to. That is wrong of you to do that. That would be wrong of me to do that. To expect something from a church that I have myself never given something to. Paul didn't do that. Paul gave himself to the churches. And then once in a while they would give him something back. He would, he, and he never asked for it. It was never for himself. If he took up an offering, it was for some other church. Like he would take up an offering for the church in Jerusalem and send it with other people, never with his own hand because he didn't want people to accuse him of keeping money for himself. But once in a while, a church that he had established, that he had given himself to, would want to give something to him. But he didn't go into churches that he didn't found with his hand, hand out and saying, give to me. He didn't go into a church that he didn't have a commitment to, where he hadn't taught them and instructed them, and say, give me something. If you want something, you want something from the body of Christ, remember, you will get what you give. You give yourself to that body of Christ. That body of Christ will give itself for you. This is the principle of the local body of Christ. If you don't understand this, there is a problem. And we all have problems in life. The wonderful thing I have found about teaching young people is that when you alert them to their problems, they often change. They often change. Hey, yeah, I, I have this problem. So I change. That means you get better. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you don't understand something fundamental about the body of Christ. <clears throat> it's when you learn, you know, when you learn how to, to, to do an integral. You know, you didn't know before. Now you know. That is a good thing. There was something fundamental in your calculus that you didn't know. Now you know how to do that. There is something fundamental in the Christian body of Christ that you don't understand if you can't become a member of a local church. If you can't become a member, it means you have a problem. Solve that problem. Go and look around at a few churches and say, God, speak to me. That doesn't mean you're going to like every aspect about that church. You will not. But you have to go to a place where you respect the authority and where you feel that you can give something back to that local body of Christ. That's what it is. Now let's go on to Acts 18, verse 23. Now having spent some time there, he left and he passed successively through the Galatian region, Phrygia, and strengthening all the disciples. Now, with that verse... With that verse, we just covered 1,500 miles of Paul's travels and ministry. With that one verse. 
So in other words, God felt it proper not to give us all the details of this third missionary journey. So he was in Antioch for some, some unprescribed time, some time that we don't know about. And, and uh, uh, then he set out on his third journey. So now this trip back from Ephesus all the way back to Syria, Syria was a long way. Something, I, I don't know, six, seven hundred miles. We have no details of what he did other than the fact that he stopped off at Jerusalem and then he went to Antioch. Now we cover another 1,500 miles on his third missionary journey in one verse. And that's all we're told. Now remember what this Bible does in this, in this book in particular. This book is called the Acts of the Apostles, but it's really of only two apostles. It's first of Peter and then of Paul. We cover the life of Peter up to a certain point, and then we don't hear much more about Peter, and then it switches to the life of Paul. There's a, a transition uh, uh, in there, but uh, with Stephen, Stephen is the transition from Peter to Paul. But there is, it talks about Philip the Evangelist, a short, a short section which we had covered previously, I believe it was in Acts chapter 8, about Philip the Evangelist. Now we're going to take a short session again to learn about a man named Apollos. Now, this must have been a remarkable guy, because remember, this book is only about two people. Luke, as he's writing this book, covers two people, Peter and Paul. But he, he, he digresses here to talk a little bit about Apollos, who turned out to be quite an amazing figure. Acts 18, verse 24. Now, a Jew named an Apollos, a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Okay, so, um, a Jew named Apollos, it says he was an Alexandrian by birth. So now they're in the town of, of Ephesus. So here they are in Ephesus. Paul has already left. Priscilla and Aquila are in Ephesus. Let me give you a few points about Ephesus. Ephesus was a huge city in those days. It had between 250 and 500,000 people living in it. Um, There was a special provision in the law that allowed the Jews to worship freely. And because of that, many Jews lived in Ephesus. Uh, It was the center also for the black arts and and, and sorcery. Uh, It was a center for trade. It had a temple that was four times larger than the Pantheon. It was 350 feet long and about 250 feet wide, and it had these huge columns that were 60 feet high and 6 feet in diameter that had taken them 220 years to construct. So it, it, it really had this, this, this huge temple um, that, that uh, some scriptures translate it as, uh, as Diana, but there's a, uh, actually a more appropriate name, as we'll see. And it was also the, considered the gateway to Asia. So it was a huge, major metropolis. Paul ministered very briefly there in the synagogue. Then he left Priscilla and Aquila there to continue on the ministry. Well, after Paul leaves, there's a Jew there named Apollos. He was an Alexandrian by birth. That was in Egypt, so from North Africa. Alexandria was a major city as well. It was a university town, had a major library. And he was an eloquent man. And, he, and it says that he was mighty in Scripture. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in spirit. So he was quite an eloquent man. He was highly educated. And he was an eloquent man. So he was an, an extremely good public speaker. And he was mighty in the Scriptures. So he really knew the Scriptures. Now, the New Testament didn't exist at this time. That meant he was mighty in his understanding and use of the Old Testament. That's who he was. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and been fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus being acquainted only with the baptism of John. He had been a disciple of John. He had seen John proclaim 
that this is the Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Lamb of God. He was aware of this proclamation that Jesus was the Christ, but he knew nothing more. He didn't know about the death of Jesus. He didn't know about the resurrection of Jesus. So his understanding of New Testament things was somewhat limited. But he accurately taught the Old Testament. He was familiar with the teachings of John. He was apparently a disciple of John John the Baptist. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And he used to argue this very point. But there was something not complete about his, his education process here. Nevertheless, he was able to argue quite convincingly that Jesus was the Christ. And he began speaking out boldly in the synagogues, just as Paul did, he himself did. He would speak and teach boldly in the synagogue. <clears throat> Priscilla and Aquila, again, her name is listed first, heard him, and it says they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So look what they did. They saw, hey, this guy's really on fire. And he really knows his stuff, but there's some fundamental things missing because he's never speaking about the death of Jesus and the resurrection of of, of Jesus. So rather than to confront him while he's speaking in the synagogue, it says they took him aside. The, the, uh, The NIV says they took him into their home. This is a ministering couple. You see them always together ministering. A couple in ministry can be a powerful force. It is a wonderful thing to have a spouse that you can do your ministry with. It is not a requirement, but it is a wonderful thing to have it. And they took him aside. So rather than to try to embarrass him or anything, they took him aside. So look at how they tried to instruct him. Look at how they tried to correct him correct them so that they can give them more knowledge. It says they took him aside. If we see the, the pastor say something wrong or teach something wrong, you know, we can't stand up in the church and say, Ah, pastor, you made a mistake. No, go up to him afterward and share with him. And from what I have seen is the pastor here is very open to it. So go up and share and talk with him because maybe, you, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's right. And so, but look at how they handle correction. They do it in private and not in public. So they go and instruct him, and this is a couple working together, and they explain to him the way of God more accurately. Not that what he was doing was inaccurate, but it was incomplete. There were some fundamental holes here. And so the amazing thing about Apollos, even though he was well-trained, he was eloquent. He would be in the synagogues preaching... He never heard the Great Commission of Jesus. All he knew was the baptism of John. That's all he knew. But he did know that Jesus was the Christ. That he knew. And that he preached in the synagogues. And he was powerful and well-educated. And the more well-educated we get, the more powerful we get, the more eloquent we get, the less teachable we become. Little kids are very teachable. College students are teachable to some people. But as soon as students graduate from college, all of a sudden they think they know a lot, and it becomes harder and harder to teach them. And that's why if I said in a general church service, some of the things that I say in this class, many people would take offense. And they would take offense because they're not teachable. Because as soon as sin starts to confront us in my life, then I take offense. It's fine when the preacher speaks about somebody else and somebody else's problems. Then then that's fine. But as soon as it hits me and my problems, I can take up an offense. Imagine from Apollos' perspective. Who is this woman Priscilla and her quiet husband Aquila instructing him more accurately in the ways of the Lord. Think about it. He is from the major university town. He's from Cambridge. He's from the place. And this couple, who knows from where? I mean, it's a couple. I mean, they're probably not that educated. They were tent makers, for goodness sake. Remember, Paul had met them because they were of a common trade. So they were leather workers. Who are they to be instructing him? 
Who is this pastor to be instructing me? I have more education than him. You see what I mean? The teachable heart of Apollos makes him such a noteworthy figure that the Scriptures takes this diversion here from following Paul to follow Apollos, who comes out of nowhere. He was not one who walked with Jesus. He only knew John the Baptist. He was aware of the baptism of Jesus. Maybe he had seen it or he would heard about it. He knew that Jesus was the Christ because this is what he would teach, but he knew no more. And he was able to receive. May God give us a teachable spirit. And I'll tell you, I can meet students who are so teachable and they're like sponges and it is such a delight to work with them. Anything I begin to teach them, they receive it. You think so? You know, I've got to work on that. And then there's others that I try to just correct them just a little bit. And they come, I don't need that. I understand that. You don't understand any of this. And by your saying you understand, you underscore the fact of how immature you are in your faith. And then you say that to them and they get more upset. And so what am I supposed to do? Do like the Scriptures say? The Scriptures say that we acquire for ourselves teachers that will tickle our ears. Because we don't want to be corrected. The amazing thing about this man, Apollos, is that no matter how good his education, no matter how eloquent he was, no matter how good his ability to speak and to preach and to refute the Jews publicly, a little old couple can pull him aside and begin to tell him about the life of the Messiah. And he humbles himself and receives it. That is enormous to be able to have a teachable spirit to be able to get past the point that says, hey, I know it all. And what happens is, the more educated we get and the further we go on in the Lord, the fewer are the people who will speak into our lives. I have to specifically go to people that I respect and say to them, would you speak something into my life? If you see me going in a wrong way, speak into my life. Correct me. Because nobody wants to do it. Because they say, oh, you know, he teaches in this you know, Sunday school class of these few people. So who am I to, to, to teach him? And so nobody will speak into my life. And so the further on you get, the less instructors will want to speak into your life. Because they're intimidated or they feel you won't receive it or for one reason or another. And praise God for a preacher that will stand up and teach the Word of God for what it is. And let conviction come upon the congregation for what it is. Apollos was able to sit there and to receive. And imagine how it felt from his perspective. Here he is, traveling around the world, going into synagogue after synagogue, and speaking and teaching that Jesus is the Christ. And using the Old Testament as his guide. And all he knew about the baptism of John. And all of a sudden to know that he had a major hole in his theology. There was a major missing piece. Not that he was teaching anything wrong, but it wasn't all right. Imagine how it must have felt. How did the man humble himself, being so eloquent, so well educated? And the more educated people are, the harder it is to speak into their lives. May God give us childlike hearts, to be able to have teachable spirits and teachable hearts like Apollos. Then it says in verse 27, And when he, meaning Apollos, wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public demonstrating by the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So now, Apollos is able to receive. All of a sudden, Apollos becomes a part of the body of Christ, this little church that that has been established by Priscilla and Aquila, that Paul left them to be the ministers there. He is able to receive from them, and look what it does. 
it now empowers his ministry. His ministry becomes so much more effective. Not only because he knows more now, but now he wants to go across the Aegean and go witness in Achaia. And so what happens? Priscilla and Aquila, they go, and it, it, it says that they wrote letters to the disciples in Achaia. Remember, that's where they had just come from, with Paul. And so they write to the disciples, to the church that had been established there, and they say uh, uh, to greet him. And it says, and, they great, and he greatly helped those who believe through grace. So all of a sudden, these guys meet him when he comes on the ship and get him established and give him a forum to speak. And he goes into the synagogue speaking, and all of a sudden, there's a body of Christ there for him to partake with. This is what the local church does, which we miss out on when we don't understand the local church. This is what we miss out on. We think that, oh, good, I know now all about Jesus' death and resurrection. I think I'll go out and go to Achaia and witness. No, he didn't do that. He went with the blessing of Priscilla and Aquila, who sent a letter with him to have the church there welcome him. If you are part of a local body of Christ, they can do so much in sending you to the mission field on your way. And then you can greatly have a much greater impact when you get over there. Because you have a church back home praying for you. And there are young people that want to get some money from the church and go off with Campus Crusade or with InterVarsity or with any other group without any accountability to the local body of Christ. It's just, give me some money and send me on my way. The heck with the money. Take the blessing. Take the blessing. Take a letter with you. Take the encouragement of the body of Christ, the covering of the body of Christ. This is the understanding of the local body of Christ that young people just do not understand these days. They do not understand it. And I challenge not just the young people, even campus ministry leaders don't understand it. And I have to sit with them and go over with them that the parachurch organization is a wonderful organization. I got through saved through the parachurch organization of Navigators Campus Ministry when I was 18 years old. And I love parachurch organizations, but it is not the body of Christ of the local church. It is a part of the body of Christ, but it is not the local church. It is not the parachurch organization that's going to bury you if you die. Understanding the local body of Christ. Apollos understood this. He submitted to their teaching, he submitted to their counsel, he submitted to their leadership, and he's able now to go with great blessing and immediately have a forum when he goes to Achaia because he's greatly helped. Young people don't understand what it is to have a letter from the body of Christ, what personal relationships mean. I don't hire postdocs without letters of recommendation. And if it's not a letter of recommendation from somebody I trust, I don't trust it. But if it's a letter of recommendation from somebody I know, that letter of recommendation means more to me than what their, than what their PhD topic was, than what their publications are. That letter of recommendation from somebody I know. I just got a letter of recommendation two days ago on a postdoc inquiry. And this person that I know wrote to me and said that this postdoc is a mediocre postdoc. That's it. I forwarded the letter to my associate. I said, tell the person they're not getting an, an offer from us. That's all it took. When you have a letter, when you have support, when you have the body of Christ standing with you, it means an enormous amount, and young people just don't understand it. Old people don't understand it. So few Christians understand the body of Christ. What a letter from a pastor means. What a letter of relationship means. When a group wanted to use the church facilities on a regular basis for, for, for a meeting they had. He had trouble getting into the, the, the church here to do this. And he called me up. And I know this man. And I know his devotion to the body of Christ. And I know the years that he served the body of Christ. And I said, you want to use our church on a Friday night? No problem. I called up Roger. I called up Chad. It was done. It was just done. And they got free of charge every Friday night, the use of the facilities. Why? Because of a relationship. Because I knew this man. I knew this man had been a pastor for years, serving in the body of Christ. He'd established many churches. And because of a relationship 
One phone call of mine opens the door because of the relationship, because Roger trusts me. And I know this man. Young people do not understand what a letter means, what a relationship means. Not just in ministry, but in jobs, in job applications. Understanding what a relationship means. Being able to be helped on your way because of a relationship with a certain individual. This is the way the world worked then. This is the way the world works now. Because it's the only thing you can really trust. He understood the body of Christ. The body of Christ helped him on his way. And let me mention one other thing since we're on this topic. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, it talks about this. I have a personal problem with young people asking for money to go on mission trips when they themselves have plenty of money. Spend your own money to go on the mission trip. If you don't have money, let the body of Christ help you. But if you have money, you know the amazing thing is Christian parents will ask their kids to go out and raise money to go on a mission trip that's going to cost $2,000. But the Christian parents will bring their kids to Vail for skiing that winter and spend $2,000 on them for a ski trip, but won't spend more than $50 on them to go on their mission trip. Let the rich Christian father pay for his own children without having to be a burden on the body of Christ. And you say, well, where do you get that theory? Well, look in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and it talks about giving to widows. Now, widows are good. You know, the, body, the, the, the Bible talks a lot about caring for widows. In verse 3, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3, honor, widow, honor widows who are widows indeed. Well, what does that mean? Honor widows who are widows indeed. Either you're a widow or you're not a widow. No, the Bible says there are widows and then there are widows indeed. It disagrees with you if you think there's just one category, widows. It says that there are widows and there are widows indeed. Well, let's see what it means. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must fir- first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day, but she who gives herself to one pleasures is dead even while she lives. Prescribe these things as well so that they may be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. A widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation for good works, and if she has brought up children, and if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, if she has devoted herself to every good work, but refused to put but refuse younger widows to be put on the list. For when they feel sensual desires and disregard of Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation because they have set aside their, their previous pledge. At the same time, they also learn to be idle, and they go about from house to house, not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, talking about things not proper to mention. Therefore, I want younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. I mean, Paul get in trouble for preaching like that today. I mean, that's not politically correct. But look what, look what Paul does. He says there are widows and there are widows indeed. There are widows, widows who have children. Let their children take care of them. Don't let the church support them. First of all, the ones that the church is going to support are only ones who are 60 years old or over. Only those over 60 years old. The younger ones, he says, go, let them get married or let their own household support them. He says, and if they have children, their children are supposed to support, support them. Let them practice piety. And if if the children don't support them, their children are worse than unbelievers. Only take a widow if she's over 60 years old and if she's raised children. Well, if she's raised children, why aren't the children supporting her? Well, they must have died. Maybe they died in the same accident that killed the husband. But only if she's a widow, she has no children left, and if she's done a whole lot of good works, only then put her on the list of support. Not just any old widow. So in other words, if a family is supposed to support the widow rather than the church, shouldn't a family support the children going on the mission trip rather than the church if they have the means? I have the means to support my kids on mission trips. So when they have gone, I tell them, don't raise money. I will pay it. I will pay it gladly. 
I would rather put the money there than to take you on vacation this year because the mission trip will do you good. And this is for a lot more than just you guys. This is all for all the Christian parents who hear this on tape, hear this on, on MP3. Let us practice piety. He said, don't let these widows who are not widows indeed be put on the roll. That's what he said. And so, don't be a burden on the body of Christ if your parents can afford to pay for you. Christian parents, learn to practice piety and respect to your children and pay for them. And then if kids, if you have money, a stash of money, then use it for your mission trip. David said, they offered David free land for his offering. He says, no way, I'm going to pay for it. David said in, in, the, in 2 Samuel, the last chapter, I will not offer up to the Lord that which costs me nothing. The practice gets so bad that I've seen young people from this class graduate. They work as a year as an engineer. Single guys work as an engineer for a year. So they're making, I don't know, $50,000 a year. They're single guys. And they want to go on a mission trip with their church. They're writing back to all their old acquaintances from college, pay for my mission trip, which is going to cost $2,000. For goodness sake, you're a single guy. You're making $50,000 a year. Pay for it, your stinking self. Why should you be a burden on the body of Christ? Let that money be used for those who really need it to go it's on the mission field. Not for you. But it's been so ingrained in them that when you go on the mission field, you ask everybody for money. Even if my pockets are loaded. Even if my bank account is packed. I should be asking for money. This is wrong. I have shared my thoughts with people in campus ministry and say, don't ask these young people to go out and raise money. If their parents have the money, let them get it from their parents. And they, they don't like that. They say, oh no, because they can raise it too and then we can all share. I said, but it's disingenuous. Let their parents do it. Let their parents come up with the money and pay for it. Understanding the church, the body of Christ, and valuing it, and valuing how precious it is, is a good thing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. And Father, I pray that you would teach these young people to understand the body of Christ, to understand the church, the blessing of the local church, the responsibility to the local church. Let them have teachable hearts. And Father, I pray your blessing to be upon them. And I commit this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.